Now I'm going to bring up Mr. Hunter Choate. Hunter Choate's writing appears or is forthcoming in The Normal School, Tin House Online, Pleiades, and Redivider, amongst others. Hmm, we get a bit of a silver alert there. <laughs> he spent two years as the fiction editor of Borough Press Review. His alter ego works a marketing job on the 13th floor of an office building in Orlando, Florida. Now, I have another thought here I wanted to share. Um, we didn't so much ask Hunter to read at this as we told him. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Here's something I will tell you about my dear friend, Hunter. He inspires me to work harder. He works hard at his writing, and his writing is excellent. There is an unsavory thing I hate to admit, but sometimes when I am not working hard, I think about Hunter working hard, and I realize that I need to work hard. <laughs> this is not a competitive thing. It's not. It's just that I admire Hunter, and like if he made a kind of cereal for writers, I would probably buy it. <laughs> I want to hear one of his stories now. Please welcome Hunter Choate. <laughs> Thanks, Jared, uh, and thank you, Ryan, and thanks to everybody for coming out. It's an honor to be here as one of the opening readers tonight. Uh, you know, when I first l learned of the event, as Jared mentioned, they, they kind of told me that, that I was going to be a reader, but uh, one of the things that, that happened is um, it was a conversation that began with me asking them if either of them had read Fates and Furies yet, which they had, and somewhere in that conversation, that's when Jared turns to me and says, oh, by the way, we're working on getting Lauren Groff to come to town, uh, and if that works out, you're going to be one of the readers. And, and I kind of laughed. I thought for sure he was kidding. I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and then when you add to that the fact that uh, just this past, uh, past week, I was in San Francisco and... Uh, I was, came within about an inch of being trapped there through Sunday uh, due to canceled flights from the hurricane. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a shock to me that, that I'm here, but it's a, a delight as well. Uh, so again, thank you, this is a real treat. I'm gonna be reading a couple of sections from a story that appeared in Pleiades earlier this year. Uh, the story is titled, The Amazing Eurosh. Eurosh and Maya first came together during the optimistic decade following Slovenia's independence from the former Yugoslavia. He was working as a little-known magician and entertainer in a restaurant called Papillon. Images of Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman from the film of the same name adorned the walls. The waitstaff's uniforms were a nod to the movie's prison theme. Twice nightly, dividing bouts of tamer magic, Eurosh performed a miraculous escape. He would select a member from the audience, often plucked for their skepticism, to fasten him into a straitjacket. Once thoroughly fastened, Eurosh was submerged upside down inside a tall glass cylinder of water, a contraption of his own design housed in the center of the restaurant. His average time underwater was two minutes and 13 seconds. During the minutes of his escape, the restaurant's sales plummeted, but immediately following, drink sales more than tripled. Eurosh spied Maya before she even entered the restaurant. Beyond the front window, she approached with a group of women from the office where she worked. Each of the women wore a cheap dress and high heels. As they entered, Maya held the door for her coworkers, pinned the flutter of her dress with one hand. Eurosh felt something rise up inside him, like little pieces of paper set afire. Once the women were seated, Eurosh entertained them with the minor novelties of street magic. A Marlboro was made to levitate above their table, the tobacco to burn orange without the touch of flame. Eurosh plucked the cigarette from midair and puffed it as he produced carnations from behind the women's ears. He stopped and pointed to a thread that snaked from the hem of Maya's dress and formed a long S on her naked thigh. His finger hovered inches from her skin, and their gaze locked. In silence, he pinched the thread from her dress. The movement was gentle as a dragonfly on a blade of grass, but still, Maya went cold from the invasion. Eurosh tucked the thread into his pocket and produced an unopened deck of cards. While he looked away, Maya was to open the package, remove a card of her choice, and write her name on the card before returning it to the deck. 
She drew the four of diamonds and dashed her name across the top. But rather, but rather than return the card back into the pack, she dropped it in her purse before handing Yurosh the corrupt deck. Yurosh passed the deck between his hands as if weighing it. He thumbed the four of clubs from the stack, held it up for the table to see. Is this your card, said Yurosh. The women laughed and shook their heads, their faces shining like stolen coins. Three more times, Yurosh slid the wrong card from the deck, and the women delighted in the success of their deceit. Customers at nearby tables observed the spectacle of Yurosh's failures. The employees and regular patrons watched with curiosity. Never before had they seen Yurosh bested. On the fourth attempt, Maya began to protest, but Yurosh quieted her. He said there were only two explanations for his failure. Either he had selected Maya's card and the women denied it, or there was no card for him to find. And as is the case in all aspects of life, for magic to transcend illusion, there must be honesty. In frustration, Yurosh launched the cards into the air. They tumbled and twisted, flashing red and white in the haze. Quiet descended in the aftermath, and then many diners gasped and unfurled their pointer fingers upward. Stuck, face down on the ceiling, was Maya's card. Beneath her name was, Maya, was Yurosh's own signature. After drinks and food and arguments among the women over whether or not the card had been glued to the ceiling all along, Yurosh approached the table again. His straight jacket draped over his arm, bright butterflies painted on the constraint's white fabric. Yurosh asked Maya to strap him into the jacket, to clasp and tighten it so there could be no doubt as to his peril while submerged. When she pulled hard against the straps, Yurosh urged more until the force of her yanks jerked him from side to side. Once Yurosh's arms were threaded through the side loops and all four self-tightening buckles were fastened along his back, he walked to the center of the restaurant and climbed the black steps leading to the top of his glass cylinder. At his request, Maya trailed close behind, and at the top of the platform, she shackled his feet to a chain suspended from the ceiling. He whispered something in the gloom, and Maya descended the stairs. The music of silverware and clinking glasses slowed inside Papillon. Halfway to her table, Maya stopped and turned to look. The still seconds were excruciating as Yurosh knelt at the edge of the cylinder, head bowed as if in prayer. Maya stood unable to help, yet unable to turn away, both actor and observer in the events that were about to unfold. Yurosh plunged headfirst into the cylinder, water sloshing up and over the glass. Once inside, the length of Yurosh's body unwound and he began his inverted struggle. His hair pulsed like dark kelp. The curved glass distorted his image and as he fought to free himself, the water threshed with misshapen butterflies. One minute in, his clasps still fastened him tightly, and a series of small air bubbles escaped his nose. At a minute 30, the same. Nervous glances pinged between the employees and the owner, and who again looked to Yurosh's confinement. At two minutes 30, when escape seemed equally unfathomable, voices in the crowd began to whisper their fears. Maya went to the tank and pressed her hand to the glass. The space between them curved, solid. Yurosh's eyes stretched wide. She pulled her hand from the container. The ghost print lingered, and she began to slap the tank desperately. A giant bubble rushed from Yurosh's mouth to boil the water's surface, and Maya convulsed in a whimper that went mute as she clutched her throat. Her terrible struggle for air mimicked Yurosh's own, and his movements panicked. The churn of his arms quickened until one jacketed arm and then the other sprung loose. Just beyond the cylinder, Maya flopped, drowning on dry land, her dress speckled dark by the tank's overflow. As her face blued and her eyes rolled, Yurosh worked to shed his jacket and unshackle his feet. Never before had his connection to an audience member transformed from the psychic to the physical. Never before had he felt the weight of such responsibility. When he finally worked, worked himself free and escaped to the surface, air rushed to fill his lungs. And at last, Maya too inhaled. The cult of connection was the first to spring up around Yurosh. 
Most agree the first sign of the cult appeared at a performance where Yurosh transformed a bustling Hong Kong city block into a pasture complete with the emerald hills and quiet of mourning a deer. A 20 minute sliver went missing from the lives of those who vanished. Among them was a group who had tethered themselves together with the thinnest of strings tied between their wrists. They alone returned from their disappearance with tales of blind space and disintegrating selves, the faintest of tugs uniting them with each other, bridging this world and the next. In time, similar groups were spotted elsewhere, from Miami to Bombay to London, all manner of strings and wires uniting the members at the wrists. The groups moved in strange pulsing patterns, any member given to pull the others in a new direction. When they waved their arms, the wires caught the sunlight like, sunlight like wind-blown spider webs. Still others had the filaments surgically grafted to their rib cages. When distance divided them greatly, the wires hummed taut and the gentlest of shocks beneath their left breasts urged them close again. These strewn clusters of followers soon congregated online. Through chats and blogs and wikis, they began to define their ethos, to pen their book of connection. They considered themselves physical reminders of Yurosh's power to unite. They believed all great leaders shared this uniting trait, but Yurosh was the culmination of millennia moving toward a person who could force empathy, one who could inspire awe and agony at his or her whim. Through Yurosh, humanity would eventually converge. Many bristles of light radiating from the same sun. Thank you. Thank you.